It's time now for Back Pages tonight here on Sky Sports News, bringing you a first look at the sports stories in the morning's newspapers. Joining us tonight, please say the independents, Miguel Delaney and David Friel from the Scottish Sun. Good evening to you both, gents. Great to have you with us. Let's quickly run through the back pages to set the scene. Telegraph goes with this. Foden, I am worth my place. And checkmate, Ronaldo happy on a record-breaking night for him and Portugal win. Foden in the time says, I need more games next to Jude Smith. The Marcus Smith to start against Japan, for England in the rugby. And new league for elite runners to be set up by Michael Johnson. Mailback page, Foden fires back. Ronaldo's relief as Portugal nick it at the death. Sun has a cheese and pickle. Apparently key to England's physical health is pickle juice. We'll talk more about that. 10 to 1 for Cobby. Uh, Cobby Mania on Ten Hag and Pot Ticks Fox. That's Graham Potter to Leicester, by the way. Uh, Cobby is sitting pretty. Metro back page. I back page. Ten Hag clarity brings peace of mind to Mainu and Andy Robertson there. We need to get back to being us. And the Scottish Shun goes with this. Bottle of Cologne. Draw not on the cards for Clark, the Scotland manager. What a big game is that? We'll talk about that in due course. But, so gentlemen, let's start then with the Telegraph and the words of Phil Foden. Miguel, how good to hear him come out fighting like this. Yeah, it's difficult not to link it to some of the um, punditry that came out in the last few days. There has been a lot of talk about, or at least a little bit of back and forth between how much is down to Foden being used to playing in a system as he does at Manchester City. And also, Foden needing to step up as a personality, as a character. Uh, so they were very pointed words. I think he is probably right that in the sense that, like, because England have essentially just been not, not quite thrown together. But there hasn't been much of a build-up time. And just for a player that is used to a very different system. I mean, for, for all that Bellingham has been in the team for two years now, it's not actually like they've had that many games together. So, yeah, it is probably just a case of finding their feet. But until they do, I suppose, there's always that frustration that we don't see these players uh, excel or express themselves in the way they do for the club teams. Absolutely. I think some of the, the criticism, David, has, has come from Cesc Fabregas has been public about him playing 40-yard passes blind. I want to ask you about the perspective of, of criticism regarding Scotland in, in due course. But on the Foden-Bellingham debate. Is this a case of chemistry or do you feel that perhaps it's a case of Foden not playing well enough for England as he does for Manchester City? Yeah, there's probably slight, a slight aspect of that, Teddy, but I think you can't have too many good players and you can't tell me that Jude Bellingham and Phil Foden can't play together in the same midfield, same front four, whatever you want to call it. You know, I think it's all about rhythm. I think it's about, as you said, chemistry, just finding that game time together. But when you look at Phil Foden and what he brought to Manchester City last season and seasons before, you know I've got no doubt in my mind that he can be a huge player for England in this tournament. And I think it's up to Gareth Southgate in the next few games just to find that combination and the slight positioning tweak just to get them you know, firing together. Yeah, people saying he maybe can't play on the left wing, Miguel. Paul Joyce writing in the Times under the banner Foden. I need more games next to Jude. Quote in here is, uh, it is improving and keep, can keep getting better. Miguel, is there an argument then for, for reverting Bellingham back to central midfield? Because that's another debating point for England, isn't it? And just playing him as a, an eight, which he can do. It seems that we've forgotten that after the, the season for Real Madrid. Yeah, and I mean, it was obviously very conspicuous that in that Serbia game, Southgate did move Bellingham back. I mean, it did coincide maybe with England withdrawing, but I feel there were bigger issues to that. And, it, and it's something we have heard around the camp that... I mean, England have an issue, obviously, in midfield right now, but would it be a bit of a kind of a missed opportunity if they didn't try Bellingham there? Since the feeling around Real Madrid is not that he's going to be this kind of number 10 or a player behind the forward that we've seen uh, in the last season, but actually he's going to be the long-term replacement for Modric as a number eight. But I think there is something more interesting there with Foden as well, because, I mean, I suppose if you look at it, a lot, a lot of the kind of argument about Foden and giving his form for City is that, uh, you know, to let him off the leash, to kind of allow him to express himself. But in some ways, it actually works the opposite, because if, if you look at Foden, there's probably not a better example of a system player in English football. This is someone whose entire career, given he's, been, he's come up through this Manchester City structure since the takeover, that has been very consciously based on Barcelona. 
And he's come through that right from when he was a youth. I mean, we all, we all know he was a ball boy, say, in 2012 or, or when City were first winning trophies mm-hmm. under this takeover. This is the system he's grown up in, and that's what he's used to. So it is a little bit of a kind of um, a gap between that and then the kind of perceptions of, well, let him play. Whereas Foden actually could probably do maybe more structure in England, which is why these comments are all the more interesting about linking up with Bellingham in that way. Yeah, they, they are a taught, David, to, to criticism, I suppose, in media circles from ex-players and alike. What's your take on that? We can go back to Telegraph headline, Foden, I'm worth my place. It's kind of a, a bold statement in a sense and a defensive statement. Do you feel that players have to get used to criticism? What have you, you made, for example, of the, the Scottish players' reaction to the weekend's game? Yeah, look, if you're going to play at this level under this scrutiny, under this spotlight, you're playing at the highest level for your country, there's going to be scrutiny. It's just part of the job. Phil Foden will be used to it at Manchester City. It's always going to be a bit different at English level. He's had so many plaudits this season. It's probably a little bit strange for him now to be questioned. His role in any team being questioned, his form being questioned. To touch on the Scotland players, I think they've all been hot with the criticism, but what they've not done is, is shied away from it at all. I think England's obviously different. They won their opening game. I would agree with Miguel. I, th- I think almost the, the midfield behind the front front three, sorry, is is probably the problem. I don't think the balance was right in there with Declan Rice and Trent Alexander-Arnold. I think we're going to come on and talk about Kobe Mino. I think someone like him or Adam Porter or even Conor Gallagher would be better. I think that might then allow Bellingham and Foden to then you know, go and express themselves a bit more than they maybe did against Serbia. Yeah, fascinating to see how the, the, the line-up against Denmark on Thursday evening, isn't it? Let's uh, talk about the sunback page now, Miguel. Cheese and pickle. Old-fashioned uh, English favourite, perhaps not as popular as it used to be, but England have a new photographer and secret ca- cramp remedy. Apparently, Gareth Southgate's squad, snapped by midfielder turned photographer Declan Rice, are drinking sodium and potassium-rich pickle juice to fight fatigue. I presume it's something to do with electrolytes, Miguel. Is that going to be a concern, do you think, cramping? It's, it's relatively temperate in Germany at the moment, isn't it? Well, although the one thing about it is, I mean, it's not so much maybe the kind of... Um temperature on the conditions, but more so the fact there's such a quick turnaround between games. And and that after a long season and amid this bigger debate about the football calendar. Uh, so from that perspective, I mean, even if it's not necessarily physical, but a psychological, almost psych- psychosomatic effect, <laughs> if players feel it helps them, that's what they'll do. And it was funny, actually, even I was at the, the Kobe Mainu uh, chat today, uh, and he actually didn't know about this um, this <laughs> trend going around some of the squad. So when it was put to him that it actually alleviates cramp, uh, he, he was suddenly very enthusiastic about potentially taking it. Well, I guess at 19 years of age, you probably run all day as well. Came off the bench, yeah. didn't he, in the, in the first game. Let's go on that note to the back page of the Metro. Got Kobe Mainu pictured, as Miguel mentioned, speaking to the media. Mainu relieved that United boss Ten Hag kept hot seat. Maybe we'll get to that in due course. But that second part there, the uh, I am happy to come off the bench or start. David, where do you see his candidacy for a, a starting place? A lot of people maybe ruminating on Trent Alexander-Arnold in that first game. Yeah, I think he's got a strong case. You know, as I said, I think he would just bring better balance next to Declan Rice. And I think if Gareth Southgate can get that right, get the protection for the defence just a bit more solid, you know, come up against Denmark on Thursday, and that's going to be a really tough game. Denmark are really, really strong in that area. You know, obviously, you know, but Christian Eriksen, um, Hoiberg and Hulman down there, a really, really strong team with Delaney coming off the bench. So I think England have to get that right if they're going to progress as far into this tournament as they want to. I think that looking at the first game, I just felt that the balance wasn't right. I think Kobe Mainu, I think he's got a real, real chance of starting. Absolutely. Well, Kobe Mainu, as we say, speaking England, speaking Manchester United as well today, Miguel. You were there, the back page of the mirror, my main man. Obviously, play on words there with, with Mainu. Kobe Delight at United's Ten Hag call. I believe Kobe Mainu put something out on social media when news of Ten Hag staying broke, Miguel. But this is, I suppose, the first official press conference where a player has, has put his support forward. I suppose it's after the event now, but how crucial do you feel Mainu's performances this season were in securing Ten Hag that new contract? Oh, that's the thing. I mean, Mainu spoke about having peace of mind now that uh, the manager's future has been settled. Uh, he spoke about his excitement about uh, building a new project and winning more trophies under Ten Hag and how he's, he's, uh, he's happy that this decision has been taken. And while people might say that, of course, he's going to say that, given it's his <laughs> club manager and his boss, I think there is actually something more specific here, given he did actually start to talk about how he's grateful to Ten Hag for giving him his chance. I mean, it, it's still, I mean, given that he is a Manchester United player who scored in the cup final and is now in a European Championship squad, it's easy to forget how young he is. And that it was actually a risk. And of course, as you say, 
Teddy, um, that Manchester United specifically mentioned the development of Manu uh, when when giving their reasons for keeping Ten Hag in the job for next season. So it does work both ways, but equally, you could really sense the genuine gratitude that Manu had for Ten Hag. Absolutely. As you make the point, it probably couldn't uh, go against the decision, but at the same time, seemed very sincere in those comments. 19-year-old uh, there, Cristiano Ronaldo, once 19 in a European Championship. Record, though, sixth appearance. Uh, Portugal, though, just nicked it at the death, uh, as the mail reports here. Francisco Conceição off the bench. Uh, Portugal, so many wonderful players, David, in that squad. Does it underscore, perhaps, why we were a little bit overboard criticising England after the weekend? Do you feel watching Portugal labour to that win? Yeah, I, th I think so. It was, look, it's the first game. You just want to go off that win. I think Portugal deserved their win. Czech Republic are a pretty you know, durable side. They made it hard for them. I think Ronaldo, I was reading the piece Michael wrote to, uh, Miguel sorry, wrote today just about Roberto Martinez and how he's managed to shape this Portugal team with Ronaldo in it still as a focal point and the coach and the man management that's gone into that. And you know, I thought he was a threat tonight. Great moment at the end for young Conceição. I think he was eight months old when Ronaldo made his Portugal <laughs> debut. Back in 2003, which I think sums up the influence of Ronaldo on Portuguese football and his longevity and everything. So I think Portugal are another team that can go deep in this tournament. Had some shots, had a hand as well, Miguel. David. He, he played with um, with uh, Conceição's father, so who scored a hat-trick in 2000. Now, Ronaldo wasn't in the 2000 squad, but they did play together for Portugal. Well, so really a Spanish generation. Well, how extraordinary a story is Cristiano Ronaldo, Miguel? Because he's not just there to make up the numbers. Well, he did have a, a threatening moments tonight at, at 39 years of age. The longevity is pretty phenomenal. Do we sometimes take it for granted? Yeah, and there's always that sense. When someone else scores a winning goal like that, you do wonder sometimes, does Ronaldo want it to be him? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> he is that kind of ultimate competitor. But um, but I suppose that, that that's what keeps him going in that way. And it's interesting even, you know, David's reference it there. After the 2022 World Cup, when it was expected that Ronaldo would be moved on, and it was it was seen as a real surprise that Martinez brought him or basically kept him around, it was seen as a, a potential issue. But instead, he's been managed well, and crucially, Ronaldo kept scoring not just in the Saudi Pro League, but for Portugal, ten goals in the qualifiers, including including one incredible one last week in a friendly against Ireland. So, I mean, he's still very much an option. But it's interesting, given this has been, I think, so far almost. The tournament of youth in the most part uh, a lot of these kind of big older four older forwards like Lukaku like Lewandowski like Ronaldo haven't actually scored yet so we'll, we'll see if that dynamic persists yeah 130 goals for his country we'll see if Ronaldo does play for, for Martinez in the in this knockout stages potentially if they come up against some of the uh, big boys so then thank you for now Miguel and David going to take a quick break You are watching Back Pages tonight. Welcome back to you. And it is welcome back to the Independence, Miguel Delaney and David Friel from the Scottish Sun. David, let's come to your paper now. The headline we teased, the bottle of cologne, skipper Robbo, Andy Robertson's on scent of glory. Of course, the match against Switzerland taking place in Cologne. What did you make of the, the captain's words? Do you feel it was a good rallying call, David? Yeah, it was a good rallying call. I'm just wondering, though, Teddy, given our earlier chat about England, whether it was a, a bottle of pickle juice we should need <laughs> yeah. up in Cologne instead. <laughs> yeah, it was a, look, a great rallying cry. I think Andy, both post-match against Germany, sorry, after Germany, and then today has been very honest. I don't think he has pulled any punches in terms of his criticism of the performance and Scotland basically not turning up against Germany. But I think, as he said himself, he gave the players until Saturday night and he told them after that, you need to move on, we need to start focusing on such a big nation. And his own quote is basically, it's time for action. Scotland need to show they're far better than they showed against Germany. It was a night when probably the biggest anti-climax maybe in Scottish football history in terms of the mm -hmm. national team because so much was expected, it was so long awaited and the team just didn't turn up. I think he said himself, you know, there was a bit of fear in their play. And to, to lose 5-1 was quite humbling, I think. And I think it's up to Scotland now and Steve Clark to come back tomorrow night and really put on a show and try and you know, salvage this Euros campaign before it's over. Indeed, it's a blistering start by Germany, Miguel. But Andy Robertson, really candid here, mentioned the fear word, actually, in terms of talking about how Scotland were on, on Friday. He says, we need to get back to being us in the eye. How important it is mentality against the Switzerland team. Looked pretty good, didn't they, against Hungary? Yeah, uh, it was striking. I mean, because that was seen as a 50-50 game and Switzerland actually were much better than Hungary. Um, Switzerland have themselves have kind of a, 
they've had an interesting generation of players come through. Uh, but it's funny, even like I mean, from my previous role having covered the Irish national team a lot, it's actually funny. You know, or not funny, but it's interesting watching some of the discussion around Scotland because Ireland have been in similar situations, not least Euro 2012 against Spain, where. I mean, I was at that game, the Scotland-Germany game, and from my perspective, while I think you could certainly question Clark's tactics, there was almost that element of Germany just taking it all out of the equation because they were that good. But obviously, of course, from the other side, and I, mean, I haven't seen it myself when covering Ireland in that regard, there are still things you fixate on that could have been done better. That, and I suppose the bigger question for Scotland now isn't so much what they did in Germany against Germany as Robertson's picked up on and as Clark has tried to uh, change, but as, as, David's picked up, as David said there, it's about actually getting that out of their system and getting back to what they do best. Which, I mean, I think coming into the tournament, Scotland would have, been seen as, would have been seen as one of the more awkward teams to play against. Certainly, they were certainly seen as tricky for Germany in that opening game. Yeah, absolutely, given the qualifying results against Spain and, and Norway. Get, drop back to your paper, David, in the Scottish Sun. Draw not on the cards for Clark. It's tricky, isn't it? Because I believe in 2016, Portugal won it after getting three points in the group stage. But the deficit, the goal difference makes it difficult, doesn't it? If we look at the group, what's your take on, on the Switzerland game? Do you feel that it, it, it's vital to get something out of it ahead of Hungary? Because that doesn't look easy either. Yeah, look, before the, the tournament started, Steve Clark was pretty adamant that four points would be enough to get through. That was the target. That was the minimum target. And I suppose in a way after Germany, nothing's changed. What has changed is confidence has been dented. I suppose on Friday night, we were all probably guilty of blind optimism. I'd say it's now cautious optimism. Nothing has changed in the sense that these two games, Switzerland and Hungary, were always going to be the best chance of getting points for Scotland. As I said, the confidence has been dented. Morale has been dented expectation, I don't know if it's maybe down a wee bit now, but this Scotland team still has it in their own hands. You know, Switzerland, I felt, were impressive for an hour against Hungary, but I still think for all they've got really, really good players, Premier League players, Scotland have also got Premier League players. And as I said earlier on, this team is far, far better than they showed against Germany. I'd agree with Miguel in terms of Germany can outfly, they're world class and they will go, I think they'll go all the way to the final. However, Scotland let themselves down and being too passive, they weren't aggressive enough. In terms of a game plan, as Andy Robertson said after the game, they just didn't execute it at all. I think going into tomorrow night, I think everything has to be so much better from the coaching, from the players, everything in terms of the approach, it just has to be so much better. And if they do that, then Scotland can win this game tomorrow night. And if that happens, then everything's fucked in its head. Yeah, a huge match. We'll be reacting to it on back pages tonight on Wednesday. Hopefully a positive result for Scotland. Miguel, let's get to a story that you've uh, released. The Africa Cup of Nations new dates threaten... Premier League Christmas schedule. What can you tell us? Yeah, so the, the story I've got today is basically that the African Cup of Nations, which was supposed to be next summer, is now instead, it, it's not fully confirmed yet, but it's at quite a late stage of talks. It's instead going to be from mid, or sorry, from late December to late January, between two dates of the new expanded Champions League. And obviously that uh, clashes with the very extensive uh, Premier League and EFL Christmas programme. Uh, but what's, I suppose, even more conspicuous about this is the only reason it's being moved, or uh, sorry, at least that's why, what a lot of people in football think, is because of this new expanded Club World Cup that FIFA are intent on putting in next summer, even though so many people say there's no space for it in the, in the calendar. It's already the source of a legal action, or uh, sorry, the motivation for legal action from FIFA Pro and the PFA. And also, I mean, just summing up the complications that come with this, um, it might even require, this move might require a change to FIFA's own regulations because the current rules state that club sides don't have to release play, players from more than one international tournament every year. This would be two in the same year. And I mean, it, it does you know, fit into all these, or sorry, well, it fits in being an ironic phrase there because the big debate is that there's, there's no more space in the calendar. And this is just, this sums up the problems and sums up the problems with this expanded Club World Cup. And it does show some of the mess the football is getting into. I mean, Richard Mass has already spoken about this extensively. Um, and, you know, it feeds into this kind of wider climate of where it seems like there's perpetual legal action in football now, something we haven't mercifully seen at the Euros. 
And there's only so much pickle juice can do, I suppose, as well, David. Jamie yeah. Carragher's been tweeted about the amount of football we ask the top players to play is beyond a joke. The quality drops and, more importantly, the injuries rise. Uh, FIFA Pro will have more battles on their hands with UEFA and FIFA going forward. I suppose that is the point. It's the elite players, isn't it, who everyone wants to play for them, club and country. Do you see that there will be legal action for those players, for the De Bruyne's of the world, to, to regulate how many they can play in a calendar year? Is that the only way forward? Yeah, I think so, because it, f it feels to me that, you know, we're trying to f can fit more fixtures into an already congested calendar, and I think something's got to give at some point, because you talk about quality, but you've also got a duty of care to the players. Now, I can hear the people already saying, look, the players are well paid, they're awarded handsomely, the athletes are doing the job that everybody would love to do, that's fair enough, but the standard's going to drop, so there's going to be you know, a drop-off somewhere in terms of a club football and international football. It's just too many games. As I said, it's already a congested fixture calendar with all the international stuff. The Champions League, Europa League, that's now been expanded as well. So are we just going to keep putting fixtures into this calendar? I think, as I said, you know, I can see legal action down the line with this. Yeah, also testing uh, fans' passion as well to an extent and their finances as they're following all these games. Uh, Miguel, a final thought. Got about 30, 35 seconds. So Graham Potter in the sun. Pop ticks Fox. Jack Rosser saying that Leicester are close to making Graham Potter their new boss. Does that make sense, given this, the style Maresca played and the, the style that Potter's played in the past? Yeah, it actually feels like a perfect fit. Um, I think we all expected almost Potter to go back to Brighton. But Brighton did what they often do and go very different or pick pick a name that other people wouldn't have thought about. And it does mean a much more logical move is Potter to Leicester. It's an interesting one, though, because Leicester are potentially facing a points deduction, so that was seen as maybe a difficult job to fill. But Potter is certainly someone who can maximise what they've got there. Yep, good to see Potter back more than a year since he left the Chelsea. David Friel, wonderful to have you on the show. Miguel, great stuff. Keep enjoying Germany. We'll speak to you both again soon. Thanks a lot for being with us. If you missed any of the show, there is another chance to see back pages tonight at half past the hour. And the show, remember, is also available as a podcast. Just download back pages on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join us again Wednesday after the Scotland game, 10.30 p.m. Our guests will be Heather Dewar and Jason Bird.